take yourself for granted because you are something special so there never has been and never will be anybody exactly like you it just goes to give you more and more understanding so I praise God in whom all knowledge lies I imagine how awesome he has perfectly made us without a replica there is no replica to who you are so now begin to understand how important you are to not allow yourself to be beaten by circumstances or allow yourself to be to be abandoned by society because one big thing I like so much about this is the fact that this man is not referring to any particular race he's just talking about human being this gives me so much power because nobody out there should ever make you feel small feel inferior feel out of place because there's everything great about you there is no small or big in the eyes of God we just individual uniquely made different from the other it is just too much to comprehend for for me and my household we will serve the Lord and I serve him with all my heart because I cannot begin to connect how unique I am and that's how I want you to think about yourself too you are unique and special in every way so it is obvious that God loves variety and that's why he made us all different he says we should look around ourselves you are never going to find anybody that looks like you acts like you thinks like you it is not possible especially the thinking part that's the part that really excites me because sometimes i hear people complain about um competition oh yeah but their business is going to compete with me and i, and I always wonder do, do they think like you because no other human being can think like you. People might say, let me imitate what she's done. But the fact that you are different in your thoughts, the ideas you bring on board will never be what these people will bring on board. Never. So he created each of us with a unique combination of personality traits. God made introverts and God made extroverts. He created those who love routine and those who love variety. And trust me, in my household, I've seen, I've seen so much varieties. Sometimes you, if you're not strong, you want to give up. You go, what is this? Because there are those who obviously want to see an organized place. I am that. If I'm, if I'm in a kitchen, for instance, and everything there is not organized, in my head, I feel it is not connected. My head feels like it's disorganized. So for me. First thing, if I want to cook, I want to organize my kitchen before I can cook. And two minutes later, if I just walked out, my husband comes in, he scatters everything. He just takes them all apart. And my son comes and he drops out more, more stuff. And my daughter comes and she throws. And so by the time I come back again, he's like, oof, what just happened here? Then I start again to organize it again. And I walk away and it comes back as if it never happened. So that's what you see on a daily basis. And the book confirms it. It says there are those who love, there are those who love routine. That's me, I love routine. And there are those who just want everywhere disorganized. I remember watching a movie once and I think that's what happened with this lady and her husband. She was an artist and she just loved the mess because obviously for her creativity, she needed the mess. And the husband needed calm. And they always had loggerheads in the end. She had to have her room where she put all her stuff. And he had a room where he put all his stuff in his organized state. So you see how we are so different. And what you're going to find is sometimes we step on each other's toes. Because when I'm liking the routine and my husband is liking the you know the, the scattered format you thinking but why are you not being organized and he's thinking but why are you not being 
disorganized. So then tension grows. But that's how we were made. He said, some of us are made to be extroverts and some of us are made to be introverts. Some of us are made to like routine and some of us are like made to like variety. So he made some people think us and others feel us. So when I'm thinking thoughts, I'm constantly thinking, what next, what next, what next? Somebody around me who just is not bothered and is like, oh, did you just think that? And sometimes you find that even when you're thinking, like I enjoy thinking, I create the image in my head. I know exactly what I'm going to do. And then I say to somebody what I'm thinking, they go, no, I don't get it. Mm, I, I don't see the picture. I don't get it. Because they are not the one thinking it. So they are never going to understand this image that I have already created in my head. God made all of that. So some people work best when given an individual assignment, while others work better with a team. So some people would like to just work by themselves. Again, that's a good example with the, my husband. He, he is at best when he's on his own doing his own thing. And I am at best sometimes when I have to send people, you, you do this, you do that, you do that. And I'm thinking it will all help to create a bigger hole. God created all of that. Bible says God works through different people in different ways. Do you get that? God works through different people in different ways. But it is the same God who achieves his purpose through them all. So he works through us in different ways. But in the end, he achieves the purpose through all of us. Bible gives us plenty of proof that God uses all types of personalities. So in the Bible, go in there, you're gonna see all types of personalities. It just goes to show that the personality thing will always be there. If you started in the Bible, it's as real as we live today. Peter was a sanguine. Paul was a cauterist. Jeremiah was a melancholy. And so he says, when you look at the personality differences in the 12 disciples, it's easy to see why they sometimes had interpersonal conflicts. So this just confirms what we just saying. In every home, you're going to see all types of personality traits. And now he says there is no right or wrong temperament for ministry. Or even in our community, there is no right or wrong. It just comes down to us being able to tolerate each other and understand that all these traits are coming from one source. We need all kinds of personalities to balance the church and give it flavor. Again, to balance our community and give it flavor. And this is where we keep reminding ourselves that it's about that complete whole. That though we are many, we are from one. From one source. We are one body. Because it's that variety that makes us who we are. The world would be a very boring place if we were all plain vanilla. So he used the taste of vanilla. If all of us were plain vanilla, the world would be a boring place. Because it would be so predictable. You would just know what is going to happen next and you know. And then that would be a plain, plain sailing life where there is no up or down. It's just one level. That's not how God wanted it. He loves variety. Fortunately, people come in more than 30, 31 flavors. So that's what he said. We come in 31 different flavors. Your personality will affect how and where you use your spiritual gifts and abilities. For instance, two people may have the same gifts and one is introverted and the other is extroverted. That gift will be expressed in different ways. Woodworkers know that it is easier to work with the grain so people who work with wood know that it's easier to work with the grain rather than against it. In the same way, when you are forced to act in a manner that is out of character, so anything that's out of the way you were naturally made for your temperament, it creates tension and discomfort. It requires extra effort and energy and it produces less than the best results. 
so whenever you're going out of your personality to do things that don't connect with you what it does it it creates tension this is why mimicking someone else's ministry never works this is why whenever you try to imitate other people you don't get it because that's not you that's not you and i tell you for me being an african that was one big message i got living in the west and that's why you find me most of the time i'm either wearing my african outfit or doing something to show my my roots so to say because i realized especially when i went into hair and went into natural hair and hair braiding i realized that if which i did if i did hairdressing or um cosmetology and i was struggling to learn how to blow dry hair and cut hair in layers or all of the things that come with hairdressing or cosmetology someone out there is going to stand over me and want to judge me constantly you haven't done it right no this is the best way this is how it should be done and why do you think you know it you know so i could not deal with that i wanted a situation where i am comfortable where i know what i'm talking about because only i know what i'm talking about and that was why i chose natural hair that was why i chose braiding because I realized this was a part that wasn't well traveled. This was a part that was new. This was the part that I needed to bring out to the world, which I did. If I had just gone to learn hairdressing, which I remember then when I was starting, people were like, oh, but braiding and hairdressing, they're the same thing. I said, they're not the same thing. Because you can be an expert hairdresser and you have no knowledge of braiding. And so, if you constantly try to imitate somebody else, try to be somebody else, you're never going to be comfortable with that role because it's not natural, it's not flowing. And this book has confirmed what I thought all these years. And so it's best for you to find that thing that naturally connects with you because then that's when you bring out the best of you. The best of you is what God wants from you. And so, God made you to be you. You can learn from the examples of others, but you must filter what you learn through your own shape. So while I went and did hairdressing, I knew that I needed hints and hints of information from that to use it to connect with hair braiding that I wanted to do. And there were so many things I learned. I learned about hair and how hair grows and what foods you eat that helps your hair grow and how you care for your hair and the hygiene required for hair i learned all of that but the act of braiding i didn't have to learn from anyone because in as much as i went various trainings and various knowledge or or or, or um, seminars and workshops i knew that when it came down to it i just loved working with hair and i knew i could do a lot with hair like stained glass, our different personalities reflect God's light in many colors and patterns. So each of our personalities is reflecting what God wants from us. So can you see a room full of different personalities? That's just the way God loves it. In a family full of different personalities, that's how God wants it. It's like a stained glass. When you look at it, depending on what color of the glass you're looking at, that's what reflects back to you. When you minister in a manner consistent with the personality God gave you, you experience fulfillment, you experience satisfaction, you experience fruitfulness. And that's the same thing with life. When you live the life that connects with you, you're going to find that you are a happier person for it. Shape, employing your experience. So that's the next one. You have been shaped by your experience in life, most of which were beyond your control. So the experiences we've been through from childhood and everything we've become today, whatever stage you are, are experiences that you had no control over. 
God allowed them for his purpose of molding you. I was having this chat today with my daughter and she's like, oh, when times are difficult, I don't even know where to start from. Um, and I said to her, listen, God has a reason for your experiences. God has a reason for your difficulties. It's making you a stronger person. And she has a very good example. Very, very good example. Which, when I reminded her, she said, yes, I think you're right. Yes, I am right. Because when things happen to us, which we're going to look at now, we feel like we want to run and hide or just kill ourselves with lots of people do. They go and commit suicide. But these things are happening for a better reason. You're meant to be stronger. You're meant to overcome them. And you remember my story when I started reading this book. I was at the, I was at the death of it. I, I could not lift myself up. My spirit was down. And then this book came and, you know, the voice came, read this book. And I thought, yes, let me try. And today I feel a lot lighter because now I'm being told so many things that I had experienced and could not have any understanding of, the, of them. And now I have clearer understanding. But remember what the Bible said as well. In all things, seek understanding first. And I tell you, one of the biggest things I've had to deal with is trying to understand human beings around me because the mistake most of us make is we expect other people to be like us we constantly judge people based on who we are but that's where we get it wrong because like he's explained here our dna is different the mutation the uh, mutation of how this dna works is beyond human comprehension can you imagine 15,000 decisions you can make in a second from your mind. That just tells you how amazing we are. And so using your understanding of yourself to judge other people is where we've been getting it wrong. We're all different. And so God allowed the different problems we deal with to happen so he can mold us for a better person. And I remember in one of the chapters where he talked about molding Moses for 80 years before Moses took on the the big the big project he gave him to go and deliver the children from from Egypt and also the story of Joseph of how Joseph traveled he was sold and then he was in prison only for him to end up being the the the, the prime minister so when you find yourself going through difficult times it's not because God hates you because lots of us think that. So this is an interesting part where we're coming to now. It says, in determining your shape for serving God, you should examine at least six kinds of experiences from your past. Because here we're talking about experiences. It says, family experiences. What did you learn growing up in your family? That's the question he asked you. What did you learn growing up from your family? I have so much on my family. Educational experiences. What were your favorite subjects in school? Vocational experiences. What jobs have you been most effective in and enjoyed most? What job have you done over time that you really enjoyed most? Spiritual experiences. What have been, what have been your most meaningful times with God? What kind of time do you feel God really touched and impacted on that situation? And I know so many that I can refer to. Ministry experiences. How have you served God in the past? In what different ways? Painful experiences. What problems, hurts, thorns, and trials have you learned from? What kind of things have you been through that has touched you, that have hurt you, that have pained you? What have you learned from it? It is this last category, painful experiences, that God uses the most to prepare you for the ministry. This one was really spot on for me. He says, God never wastes a heart. So each time you're feeling hot, each time you're feeling down, each time something out of your control happens to you and you're feeling really, really like you've lost it all. 
that's the time that God wants to use you most. And I remember writing somewhere, I, I think I'm coming to that. He said, your greatest ministry will not, will most likely come out of your greatest heart. I felt, wow, your greatest ministry will come out of your greatest heart. So I remember writing, I think I said, let your challenge be your opportunity. Yes, I wrote that. Let your challenge be your opportunity. Because that thing that really hurts you most, that is a school. It's like a school in itself. It's something that's going to teach you so much. Let your challenge be your opportunity. Your greatest heart is your greatest ministry. So I call it, let your experience be your ministry as well. Because you have experienced it, you can talk about it. You can talk clearly from your experience. You have felt it. You have been on that journey. You know that journey inside out. Now, what better ambassador could there be for such an experience? Of course, it's you. You become the spokesperson for that experience because you've been through it. Because you felt the pain, you felt the hurt. And that's why he says your greatest hurt is your greatest uh, um, ministry. Because you are now representing that pain. You feel the hurt and you know how you coped to survive that experience. You overcome it and became stronger for it. So you know what they say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So for you to have overcome that experience, that hurt, that pain, that challenge, you are a stronger person. You are a stronger person. And you know the experience I was, I was saying about my daughter um, having her own experience. We moved out of London to this outskirts of London where we live now. And she left a very good school and we not knowing what we were doing at the time. She got into a school that was less serious with education. And my daughter had to sit on her own to study and study and study by herself because the teachers were barely there. In the end, she went through all the exams and got her grades and thank God for that. Now she's in university and she says, mom, even when things are tough and she wants to complain, I said, but do you remember when you sat down by yourself and read all by yourself? Oh yeah, you're right. And she gets on with it. Most of her friends who had ex amazing grades, sitting in very good schools, now cannot cope with the university life they're experiencing. And now what happened? While she was in this other school that pushed her to study by herself and she thought that was the worst thing that ever happened to her, that had actually prepared her for a bigger experience of dealing with university life. And this is how these things work. This is how they work. Because those difficult things that you are experiencing at the time, they are preparing you for bigger things. And that's why God prepares people to deal with bigger things. People, people who go through the most difficult times are the ones who are going to cope when things are rough. Who could better minister the parents of a Down syndrome child than another couple who have a child afflicted in the same way? So he's given examples. Who could better help an alcoholic recover than somebody who fought that demon and found freedom? So if, you, if you've been through alcoholism and then you now see someone who's going through the same thing, only you who have been through it and have overcome it can talk to that person. Someone who's never been through that experience cannot come and, and then usually, you know, like when you're a teacher in a class, normally your students want to know what gives you the right to come and teach them. And so could you give us some of your experiences that put you in that position to teach me? That's the same thing we're talking about here. So if you know you want to be able to discuss a topic, have you experienced that topic? And it always makes me laugh most times when you see people who claim to want to talk about babies and children and they're not even mothers or fathers. And then you wonder, what basis are you telling me this story for? Is it a book you read 
or is it something you actually experienced? You say, who could better comfort a wife whose husband has left her for an affair than a woman who went through that agony herself? I can be an ambassador for that because I can explain to you what I experienced when I had difficult times in my marriage. Because I've been there. So when people talk to me about that, I say, I know the feeling. I know what I went through. God intentionally allows you to go through painful experiences to equip you for ministry to others. So when you have experienced difficult things and you've overcome it, you're now prepared, you're now stronger to help others who are going through similar situations. The Bible says he comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. So he comforts us so we can comfort other people who are experiencing similar things. When others are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God gave us. Because he did comfort us. And that's why he gave, sometimes he plans strategic people around us that can give us words that suits the pain. If you really desire to be used by God, you must understand a powerful truth. truth. The very experiences that you have resented or regretted most in life, the ones you wanted to hide and forget, are the experiences God wants to use to help others. So those experiences that you went through that hurt you so much, that you wish never happened, that you want to hide and pretend it wasn't there, those are the experiences that God wants to use you to help others with. They are your ministry. So do you get it? So anything you've ever struggled with, anything you fought, anything you wish never happened to you, anything you've regretted, those are things God wants you to use to help other people. I call it use your challenges as your opportunities. Your hurts, your pains, your challenges, your worries, etc. are issues you have to face head on and then use the experience you, you used to overcome it as your opportunity to help others in similar situations. But he gives us a warning. He says, for God to use your painful experiences, you must be willing to share them. Now, this is a big thing. You have to be willing to share this knowledge. And this is where most of us go wrong. You have to stop covering them up and you must be honest about your faults or your failures and your fears. So whenever you agree to take on these things, whatever these experiences are, you have to be willing to talk about it openly. And this is where I find lots of us fail. Because if you are, you've been watching this channel and you've been with me, you find I talk about the things I have experienced. Now, one of the reasons I do that is I want people to learn from my mistakes. I want people to learn from my experiences. And that's why I talk about it. They're not meant, they're not there for you to feel ashamed, to feel you have done something wrong, to feel embarrassed. Because there's so many people who feel that way about anything they're experiencing in life. You feel like, I'm not like other people. None of us are perfect. We're not meant to be like other people. You are you. And that's why he just reminded us how unique we are. So doing this will probably be your most effective ministry. You being able to talk about it will make it so effective for God. People are always more encouraged when we share how God's grace helped us in weaknesses than when we brag about our strengths. Lots of, us, lots of us want to talk about how amazing we are. And we never remember that without the grace of God, we will be nowhere. Paul understood this truth, so he was honest about his bouts with depression. Because apparently, Paul did have depression. Now, he, he talked about it happily. He admitted, I think you ought to know, dear brothers in Asia, we were really crushed and overwhelmed and feared we would never live through it. 
We felt we were doomed to die and saw how powerless we were to help ourselves. But that was good. For then we put everything into the hands of God. Who alone could save us? For he can even raise the dead. And he did help us and saved us from a terrible death. Yes, and we expect him to do it again and again. So this is him writing about a time that was so tough that they thought they were never going to be able to make it. But then all they did was they handed it over to God and they knew that God was going to help them because he could raise even the dead. And he's so proud that God helped them and he knows that God will help them over and over and over again. And that's been my story. I've been through really difficult times. There are times I, I sit on my own and I'm wondering, where is it going? Where is this future? And then all I do is pick my Bible and I pray and I pray and I pray. And I take whatever actions that the Holy Spirit puts in my head, go and do this, go and do that. Because I know it is for great reasons. But you see, reading this book has confirmed what I thought. And I'm so glad that this has come up because now I don't feel bad again when I feel things are out of my control. Because I know they are for great reasons. If Paul had kept his experiences of doubt and depression a secret, millions of people would never have benefited from it. That's the message. If all of us keep talking away our pains, keep hiding our pains, keep pretending it's not happening, keep living in, in um, you know, when in, in, in you, you deny yourself, you say to yourself, this is not happening. Um, there's an advert I normally see on TV and, you know, this person is in debt and he, and he goes to hide. He says, stop hiding it under the sand as if it's not happening. Wake up and face things and take them on and talk about them. Because you never know who's going to hear this and we be that voice of God talking to you. Only shared experiences can help others. That's his big message. I believe people learn a great deal from other people's experiences and mistakes. This is why it is so important that we share our experiences. We really do not take them to heaven and I feel experiences are not anything anyone should be ashamed of. Rather, they should simply become lessons to learn from or to teach others. Like they say, your experience is your best teacher. And he gave an example of a man called Aldous Huxley. He said, experience is not what happens to you. It is what you do with what happens to you. So experience is not what happens to you. It is what you do with what happens to you. That's what experience is. What will you do with what you've been through? That's the question he's asking you. Don't waste your pain. Use it to help others. Using your shape is the secret of both fruitfulness and fulfillment in ministry. You will be most effective when you use your spiritual gifts and abilities in the area of your heart's desire. And in a way that best expresses your personality and experiences. The better the fit, the more successful you will be. So the more you are able to connect your personality with who you are, with the life you live, with the experiences you're dealing with, the better your life will be, the more fruitful your life will be. So again, as always, we finished our chapter, chapter 31. And before we go, we normally read his questions and meditation for us to take up. So points to ponder, it says nobody else can be me. So nobody else can be you. Just think about that. Meditation, God has given each of us some special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other. Passing on to others, God's many kinds of blessings. So each time we use our abilities, we're sharing with others. We're helping others. And naturally, this is one of my ways of sharing sharing a book that has contributed so much to me and i'm hoping you're taking it as important or as seriously as i'm taking it because it's made a huge difference in my life question is what god-given ability or experience 
can you offer to your community or to your church? So what experience that has really hurt you that you've been able to overcome can you share with people around you to benefit them? Or what, are, what, what abilities do you have that you can share with your community that can be of use to them? So we're going to end here and we'll see you in the next chapter. Thank you so much for watching. Stay blessed. And remember to like this, share it, and subscribe to the channel so you get to know more what's happening next. See you soon.